And let's get a view on referendums now from Dr Andrew Blick, who is Department Head of Political Economy at King's College London, author of Stretching the Constitution, The Brexit Shock in Historic Perspective. And he joins us now. Andrew, good morning. Good morning. So this New Zealand example we're hearing about, is it a popular idea, the the one of running referendums alongside an election? I think generally when you ask people uh, if they should be more involved in decisions and if they should have a direct say in things rather than just leaving it to politicians, they tend to say yes, in principle at least. And then I think the general idea of running them alongside an election, well, one reason for that is you're more likely to actually get people to turn out and take part in the referendum. So it is, is a way of ensuring that although they may say they want to vote in referendum, when it comes to it, they may not turn out on the day. So it may be not so much it's a popular idea as it's seen as an effective way of actually getting the vote out for the referendum. We've not had many in the UK, have we? We've had 13 above local level since 1973. 13? Oh, tell me 13. about them. 13. Well, 13. Well, the first ever one was a Northern Ireland border poll, 1973. Uh, and then since then, we've had them on things like devolution to Scotland and Wales, independence for Scotland, uh, the, the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement, uh, the, the, and of course, a London based one, the, the introduction of the, the London Assembly and Mayor. There's a referendum on that. There was one on the Northeast devolution that didn't go through in 2004. And of course, we've had uh, at UK level, i.e., everybody in the whole UK able to vote. We've had three, one in 1975 on should we carry on being in the European communities, as they were then called, one in 2011 on should we adopt the alternative vote system for parliamentary elections, and as we know well, in 2016, the most recent major referendum on should we remain within or leave the European Union. So there have been quite a few over the years. They're not a, a, a very frequent occurrence, but they do happen. Uh, and all of ours appear to be really constitutional issues, basically, rather than things like um, legalising marijuana or, or euthanasia or anything like that. Yeah, that's an interesting point, is the, what subjects they're used on. As you say, the, the kind of things, like the list I reeled off there, are what you might call constitutional issues about where power lies and you know at what level decisions should be made and should we create and should we leave certain institutions so so that's the, been the general tendency with with the referendums we use at that sort of level whereas in some other countries as you say they use them for what might be called the kind of moral social issues like for instance in Ireland abortion same sex marriage those kind of issues whereas in the UK we've tended to deal with them within parliament but maybe rather than just using the normal parliamentary voting we have what's called private members bills which allow members to vote according to their conscience rather than being told which way to vote by their party. And am I right in thinking there are some countries where they actually have loads of these? Switzerland, for example, don't they have quite a lot of uh, referendums? In Switzerland, certainly, they're famous for having lots and lots of referendums. They And they're, they're a federal system, so they divide, they put a lot of power into the kind of uh, bodies known as cantons, which are below the full Swiss level. And people in those cantons, which are a bit like the states in a federal system like in America, do vote regularly in referendums on all manner of decisions. So, yes, it's a very frequent occurrence in Switzerland at canton level. And they also have them sometimes at Swiss, whole Switzerland level. So, yes, there are certain countries that have them more than us. And Switzerland is an extreme example, has an awful lot of them. And what are the pros and cons of having a referendum rather than just having a representative government that that enacts uh, a set of decisions uh, because I think some people think well you should have more joined up government you can't just have a vote on everything well certainly that's been a major criticism of of referendum and and certainly the way in which they they may have been used in this country the idea being that uh Government has to be a joined up business, as you say. One decision affects another decision. Decisions about policy affect decisions about spending. If you, for instance, as we've seen with the European Union, if you leave the European Union, that's not a self-contained act. It has consequences for business. It has consequences for the way in which the UK is governed internally. Therefore, some people would argue to give the public a straight yes-no binary choice over what looks like a simple decision, when in fact it's a lot more complicated, 
is not the best way to proceed. That's one argument. Obviously, there are arguments in favour that some decisions are so important, like European Union membership, that the people should, every once in a while, be given a chance to have the final say on it. And and and, and, and furthermore, it might be argued that, that an issue like European Union membership was dividing the parties, particularly at the time dividing the Conservative Party. So the normal way of taking decisions through what we call the system of representative democracy wasn't working. And therefore, the way to solve this problem now, you might argue it hasn't been solved, but the theory is the way to solve this problem is by using what we call direct democracy and putting it out to the people to try and reach a decision. And it used to be argued, I don't know whether it's true anymore, that uh, something like capital punishment, for example, if we had a referendum on that, the British people would go for it, uh, certainly for certain crimes, uh, because maybe it's an emotive issue and they just think, yeah, they deserve to die. Um, I don't know whether that would still uh, be true now but i know that some people argue well that that's sh- that really that the government somehow know better no government of the day would actually bring back capital punishment but but they're out of touch with the people yes it, it's certainly been held historically that opinion in parliament has generally tended to be more liberal, if you want to use that term, than the the opinion of the public. So, for instance, uh, decriminalisation of homosexuality in 1967, some people would argue if you'd had a referendum on that, that actually uh, being gay would still be completely illegal. So, you know, you you can see an example there where Parliament has been, some would argue, out in front of public opinion, and public opinion has subsequently caught up with it. That's certainly one school of thought. And you know, I personally and others would say, well, it's a good thing that Parliament took that decision rather than you had a referendum, if a referendum would have would have voted against it. So you know, that's an argument in favour of giving Parliament uh, the position to make those kind of decisions I was talking about earlier, those social decisions. However, others would say it's better to have an actual public, wide public consensus before you get a change. The public should be ready for change. So, you know, there there were conflicting schools on that, but certainly it's been argued historically that Parliament has been more advanced, more forward-thinking than than the population, and therefore that's meant changes could happen sooner than they might otherwise have done. And do you think that uh, technology may change democracy in the future, that we could end up with lots and lots of referendums. We could practically all be MPs voting on our on our laptops or our phones for every issue? Well, I think that's a very good question. And, and it, on the surface, it might seem that way, that if technology makes something possible which I suppose it could, then then therefore it's going to happen. But it's quite interesting if you look at some of this, if you can go back as far as the 1930s and people were saying that you know, what was then a new thing like radio or television meant that very soon we were going to be doing exactly what you described, that we we're all going to be voting in our own homes and we wouldn't need a parliament any longer. We'd have a fully direct democracy. And if you go a bit further on, you can see people like uh, Tony Benn, the you know, famous Labour politician in, in 1968 when he's Minister of Technology, makes a speech arguing exactly that, that people are soon going to be able to use technology to vote in their own homes. And it hasn't happened yet. And then the referendum we had in 2016 on EU membership, we all went into ballot boxes and made a cross on a piece of paper. So we're still using that technology. Now, I think the kind of communications technology, the internet, social media you're talking about, do have an impact on politics and they have changed the way in which we do politics. But they don't yet seem to have led to a situation where we're actually doing that kind of in-home push-button referendum all day long. That's not happened yet. And I wonder whether it ever will. And if it did, would that be a very effective way of actually running a government? Indeed. Uh, Dr Andrew Blick, thank you very much indeed for joining us. 0345 6060 973. Are you in favour of more referendums? On what? Should we have a referendum on the big issue at the moment, which seems to be about lockdowns?